very good morning to all of you i welcome you for the technical session so uh, the first uh, lecture will be delivered by dr jirka simonek as i told and as we know water is the key input in agriculture and the demand for water in advancing uh, in increasing the crop production is well known and to meet the future demand for uh, water in the uh, face of its declining resource base there is need for efficient use of this resource okay and this can be possible if you understand the mechanism of water transport in soil plant atmosphere continuum and uh, for this efficient use of water government of india has uh, started many programs like for drop more crop prime minister krishi sichai yojana and all these things and hydros is one such model which is very helpful uh, to develop our understanding in soil water dynamics so keeping this in view the first lecture will be de delivered by the by none other than dr jirka simonek uh, a prominent hydrologist and developer of the hydro series of models and he will be speaking on modeling water transport and root water uptake using hydro study model for improving water use efficiency in agriculture so with this brief background i have already introduced the department of environmental uh, sciences uh, we are waiting for you sir side for your uh, deliberation and uh, i may uh, i now request dr jirka to start his lecture thank you sir okay so let me start sharing my screen do you see my screen yes sir it is visible and do you hear me yeah yes sir okay. you, are, you are audible sir okay so first of all i would like to thank you and and the other organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my work at this venue and it's a great honor and privilege to to be able to address you today. Um, so within this presentation, I want to review some of the capabilities of the Hydra software and its specialized modules, uh, which simulate mainly water flow and various other processes in the radio zone. However, first let me acknowledge also my colleagues with whom I'm collaborating very closely on developing these uh, models. So it's first of all, Rim van Geruchten, who used to be my boss at the US Science Laboratory before I joined the University of California, Riverside. Then it's Miroslav Sheina, who is the director of PC Progress, which is the company which is developing graphical user interfaces and distributing the software. And finally, Giuseppe Brunetti, with whom I'm developing a lot of specialized add-on modules in recent years. So let me first provide some background behind uh, our group. So first of all, let me see myself. So although I'm currently at the University of California in Riverside, I, I originally do not come from the United States. I was born in the Czechoslovakia where I got all my degrees. And I came to the United States in 1990. And I worked for 12 years at the US Salinity Laboratory in Riverside. And after which I joined the University of California in Riverside as well. And my specialty obviously is numerical modeling. And I want to say that I'm currently editor in chief of Journal of Hydrology. And in the past, I was working also for other journals such as Radio Zone Journal, Journal of Hydrology, Hydromechanics, WRR, and other journals. Uh, Rien van Genuchten, probably all of you know his name very well, is the most widely cited researcher in the field of soil physics and hydrology. And he also doesn't come originally from the United States. He comes from Netherlands, where he got his uh, MSc. He got his PhD at New Mexico State University. Uh, in New Mexico. And he's the recipient of the largest award in our discipline, EGU Dalton Medal, EGU Horton Medal, etc. And as I have already mentioned, 
is the most widely cited researcher. He, he retired from the US Scientific Laboratory about 15 years ago, but he's still very active, currently working with the University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, as well as the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Uh, Miroslav Sheina, he's a mathematician and he works with me on the graphical user interfaces, so he's not so physicist or hydrologist, and he's my best friend since already grammar school, so you can see you can develop this collaboration very early in life. The Czech Republic is here in the center of Europe, so I come from there, and Mirek as well. Uh, we are famous for music, classical music, beauty of our capital, and also some sports such as soccer, ice, ice hockey, and we develop technology for beer. Uh, and Rien van Genuchten, he comes from Netherlands, and uh, those and um, my our other colleagues come from Belgium, such as Zidrich Jacques, who is developing HP1 modules. And so these two countries are in the Western United uh, Western Europe, and they are both kingdom, interestingly. And currently I'm working at the University of California, which is the largest public university in the US. It has 10 campuses all around the states, and University of Cali California Riverside is, is right here. Okay, so that's that was the, the background. So now this is the outline of my actual lecture. So I, I will start with some brief introduction in Hydras. Then since I assume that this is uh, really training, mainly for students, so I also have some background about uh, how we deal with the water flow and root water and solute uptake in Hydras. Then I will list several selected hydrous applications, I will discuss them. Then I will also briefly discuss several hydrous uh, add-on modules, which can be used for more, more specialized applications than just water flow. And finally, I will discuss some other resources which are available for users of hydrous. Okay, so I will be talking mostly about the hydrous models, which are numerical models, which simulate water flows, solute transport, in one, two, and three-dimensional variably saturated soils. And how hydrous are hydrous models are one of the most widely used numerical models for simulating water flow and various other processes in the data zone. And various versions of hydrous uh, models have been used by thousands of users around the world, and thousands of applications have been published in peer-reviewed literature. And they are used not only by scientists, students, but also by practicing professionals. Uh, the hydrous models currently exist in two versions, although we do want to merge these two versions in the future. So first of all, it's hydrous 1D model, which can be used to simulate water flow and solute transport and many other processes in one-dimensional variably saturated soil. And flow and transport can occur in any direction, so it doesn't have to be vertical. And the soil profile can be layered. The model uses numerical methods to solve the governing flow and transport equations. And since the model is currently in the public domain, it has many thousands of users around the world. And I can say almost ten, tens of thousands of users. And this slide shows on the very left a relatively complex uh, soil profile layered, discretized in finite elements, and then various typical outputs of the model, such as variations of water contents with depths, different fluxes, actual and cumulative, and uh, uh, temporal series of different variables, such as pressure adds, water contents, concentrations at different depths, and so on. Uh, Hydrus 2D 3D is then a commercial version of Hydrus 1D, and it can be used to simulate flow and transport in two and three dimensional transport domain of virtually any shape. And the model, model again uses numerical methods to solve the flow and transport. And since it is distributed commercially, it doesn't have such wider user base but it is still used by thousands of users around the world. 
I need to emphasize that both models are numerical models, which means that the time and space in the model is divided into the small pieces, so called finite differences, finite elements, finite volumes. And then the governing equations are integrated over these pieces. And then this slide, I show some of the geometries that we have handled in the past with Hydra's models. So on the left, you can see a relatively complex one-dimensional layered system discretized into finite differences. In the middle here, you see some relatively simple two-dimensional domains, and these are now discretized into finite elements, into triangle of finite elements. And finally, on the right, you can see relatively complex three-dimensional domains, uh, which are discretized into tetrahedros, also finite elements. Uh, the models can be used to simulate processes in the subsurface, in the so-called Vado zone, which is the zone between source surface and groundwater, then in the groundwater, and also in the capillary fringe, which is the interface between radio zone and groundwater. And the programs can be used, can be used to simulate processes and many different spatial and temporal scales. So they can be used from um, small core or plot scales up to the field scale. And some people are using that even at the larger scale, such as watershed scale, although I, I I do not think that the governing equations are actually valid at that scale, and so those applications may not be very appropriate. Uh, similarly, with, the, with the respect to the temporal scales, the models can be used for short-term experiments, which last hours and days. One can apply them for months, seasons, many years, and hundreds of years, especially in these uh, climate change applications. Uh, the models have a, a very large number of applications because they are written in a relatively general way. And I typically divide these applications into the three groups, into agriculture application, industrial application, and then hydrological and environmental applications. Uh, in the agric agriculture applications, we typically deal with the water balance in the root zone, and then with the processes such as precipitation, irrigation, runoff, evapotranspiration, transpiration, root water uptake, capillary ice, and deep drainage. In terms of uh, solute transport, since the model is written in a relatively general way, it can deal with many different chemicals, including fertilizers, pesticides, fumigants, emerging pollutants such as hormones, pharmaceuticals, but also we can simulate transport and many different particle -like substances such as viruses, colloids, pathogens, and nanoparticles. Uh, there is also a large number of uh, industrial applications, which involve evaluations of various industrial and municipal leaks, evaluation of landfill covers and various repositories, such as from municipal or radionuclear waste, and many other applications. And finally, the large groups are includes hydrological and environmental applications. And uh, you can see that you can evaluate groundwater recharge, surface, subsurface water interactions, stream aquifer interactions, reparient system, and so on. In 1D model, we can also serve the energy balance equation. And then obviously we can simulate heat exchange and heat fluxes. The model also has the module which deals with the carbon dioxide transport and production. And so we can simulate many different types of processes. Uh, this slide shows the history of the Hydro study. I typ typically divide the history into the two main parts or time periods, into the DOS period, where we were developing mostly only the computational modules, and then the Windows period, when we were also de started developing uh, sophisticated graphical user interfaces in support of these computational modules de developed earlier. You can also see that we track our history all the way back to the work of Shlomo Neumann some 50 years ago, when he developed one of the first uh, finite element models for simulating 
flow in the unsaturated zone, which was called unsat. And you can see that about 25 years ago, just in the middle of that, from the work Shomo Neumann today, he started developing these graphical user interfaces. And today we are at version three, and we are planning to release next year version four. Um, the hydrous model solved numerically the governing equations for water flow, solid transport, and heat transport. While the variably saturated flow or Richards equation is a highly nonlinear equation, uh, which cannot be solved analytically, and so we do need numerical models. On the other hand, solid transport and heat transport equations are under certain conditions, let's say steady state condition, water flow conditions, that it, they are linear, and then they can be solved analytically, and one can use models such as stand mode or CXT fit. But for transient flow conditions, also these equations have to be solved numerically. So this slide summarizes main processes which can be solved in the standard hydrous module. So hydrous can simulate water flow, as I said already, solute transport and heat transport. And it's relatively general in terms of these processes. So it solves the Richards equation for variable saturated water flow. It allows users to use various models of soil hydraulic properties. It considers hysteresis. It includes sink terms, which uh, can account for water uptake by plant roots. And it can account for various stresses, such as osmotic stress or water stress. And the uptake can be both uncompensated and compensated. We also have tools to deal with the preferential flow. And we also have module which can deal with both isothermal and thermal flow, and both in the liquid and vapor phase. In terms of solute transport, we consider convective dispersive transport in the liquid phase and diffusive transport in the gas phase, which means that we can also simulate volatile chemicals. We also consider various linear and nonlinear interaction between solid and liquid phase, and also various uh, equilibrium and non-equilibrium reactions. We can account for both physical and non-equilibrium uh, solute transport. And again, we have a sink term in the governing equations, which can account for the nutrient uptake by plant roots. And this nutrient uptake can be both passive or active, and similarly as here, both compensated and uncompensated. Additionally, the model also has the capabilities to inversely optimize flow and transport parameters by calibrating the model against measured data, uh, which is an option very widely used by Hydra's module uh, users. So the, the terms of solid transport, the code is written in a way that one can simulate transport and single ions or particles such as viruses, colloids, bacteria, but it can also simulate fate and transport of multiple ions, which are either independent or are involved in the sequential first order decay. And here I show a couple of examples, such as radionuclides, nitrogen species, urea, ammonium nitride, nitrate, various pesticides, uh, which can degrade to daughter products, chlorinated hydrocarbons, Many of these new, new uh, pollutants, such as pharmaceutical hormones, etc. Uh, for more complex uh, problems, we have uh, quite a lot specialized modules, which can, for example, consider transport of major ions and interaction between major ions, uh, general biogeochemical reactions, processes in the wetlands, colloid facilitated transport, and others. Uh, both models are supported by sophisticated Windows-based graphical user interfaces, which makes the model relatively easy to use. So on this slide, you can see the graphical interface for Hydrus 1D and the simple applications of the model to simulate the breakthrough curves and concentration profiles of nanoparticles, which was done in some laboratory experiment. Uh, this is the graphical user interface for 2D, which is uh, much more advanced and sophisticated than for 1D. And this particular slide shows the transport domain 
with two ferros and the drain and the spatial distribution of the pressure heads and concentrations, as well as the concentration profile along this uh, cross section. Uh, this slide shows uh, pressure head distribution in a relatively complex three-dimensional transport domain. And so you can see that you can do relatively general three-dimensional domains with variable surface uh, coordinates and so on. Okay, so that was introduction into hydrous. Now I will briefly describe how we deal with water flow. So we are solving the governing flow equation, which is the Richards equation, which was developed by L.A. Richards in 1931. And L.A. Richards was a scientist at the U.S. Science Laboratory, also here in, in my town in Riverside. Uh, about how many years is that? 19 years ago. Uh, this equation assumed that the Darcy's law is valid and it is a highly nonlinear, as I mentioned, and it's highly nonlinear because of these functions. One is so-called retention curve and one is so-called hydraulic conductivity function. And these functions represent the main input into the model. Uh, I have here examples of the retention functions, which kind of characterize energy status of salt water. Each salt has its own unique retention function. And in this graph, I use the analytical model developed by Rien van Genuchten, which was published in this paper in 1980, which is by far the most widely cited paper in hydrology and has about 30,000 citations. So more than most uh, people obtain in their whole career. Uh, this is the hydraulic conductivity function, which characterizes the ability of porous media to conduct water or the resistance of porous media to water flow. This is again described by an analytical function. And in this case, I'm also using function function given here. You can see that the conductivity changes by orders of magnitude. This is log scale. Orders of magnitude, different, different source but also it decreases by orders of magnitude as soil gets drier. Uh, we use, as I mentioned, multiple functions. So we, we, we don't stick with simple function. So we offer users uh, multiple functions. On this slide, I have three, Brooks and Corey. So that's the historical function, which is still today used a lot in the oil industry. Van Genuchten function, which is almost universally used in agriculture and radio zone hydrology. And finally, the function of Kusugi, which is also implemented in hydrous. And each of these functions has its correspondent hydraulic conductivity function. So Brooks and Corey function is here, Van Genuchten is here, Kusugi is here. And they were developed using some poor scale models developed by, by uh, uh, we also support a program which is called Red C, which can be used to find the, the parameters of these functions if you have experimental data. So if you have experimental data, you can enter them into this program, and then the program will give you parameters for these functions. For those who do not have measured, function, measured data, we provide various other tools how to, to get around that. So first of all, we provide something which we call salt catalog, which gives you average values of selected soil hydraulic parameters for 12 major soil textual groups, which are based on the USDA textual triangle given here. And these are those average values for these 12 texture classes. In addition to that, we also have the so-called Rosetta program, which is the program based on neural networks, which can make predictions of soil hydraulic parameters based on the textual properties such as sand, silt, clay, bug density, field capacity, wilting point, etc. And this is the tool very, very widely used by our users. If you want to solve the governing equations, we need to specify boundary and initial conditions. And in hydrous, 
we try to be very general in terms of how users can specify boundary conditions. And we recognize two large groups of boundary conditions. We recognize so-called system independent boundary conditions, where you specify directly value of something such as pressure head, flux, or gradient at the boundary. And then this value is enforced at that boundary. Then we recognize something which we call system dependent boundary conditions, where the actual flux actually depends on the state of the system. Users will specify, in this case, potential fluxes, such as rainfall. And then the program calculates what is the actual fluxes, how much water can actually infiltrate into the soil, and how much water is excess water, which is removed by surface runoff, or which is accumulated at the soil surface. Similarly, for evaporation, the users will specify potential evaporation, which can be calculated, let's say, penman monty or Hargreaves equation. And then the program calculate the actual evaporation, how much water can actually evaporate from the soil depending on its status. There may be enough water in the profile, then the potential and actual evaporations are the same, or the soil can be dry, and then obviously actual evaporation decreases dramatically compared to potential evaporation. We have some other system dependent boundary conditions such as seepage phase, uh, flow to tile drains, which can be specified in both 1D and 2D, and so on. Okay, let me also provide some description how we deal with root water and solute uptake. So first of all, we use the macroscopic approach, which was developed a long time ago, 40 years ago, by Rainer Fedes at the Uni Agricultural University in Wageningen. And what did he do is he would take the potential transpiration, so again, the atmospheric demand, which is really independent of the soil. He would distribute this potential transpiration over the root zone depending on the root distribution. And that would be done either in 1D or in 2D or in 3D using some kind of a root distribution function B or beta. And that would give us potential uptake at different points of the root zone. And again, that's a potential uptake which doesn't take into account the conditions in the soil or conditions of the plant. And then we have something called stress response functions, which they take into account of the various stresses in the soil, such as water stress. So Reiner Fedes developed this stress response function. So this is pressure head, and this is the value of the stress response functions. And what you see here is there is some range of pressure heads, or let's say water contents, in which the actual uptake and potential uptake is, is the same. And so the value of this function is one. Then the uptake decreases toward this point, which is so-called wilting point. And below the wilting point, there is no uptake and the plant obviously wilt. On the other hand, we, he defined something called anaerobesis point. And that was close to saturation when the root water uptake plant would stop because of water logging, because of the lack of oxygen, and for such reason. We can also account for the salinity stress. And for that, we use the mass threshold and slope function, where we define the threshold above which the, 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 there is not well, the, the plant is no stress because of the osmotic head. And then there is a slope when the uptake decreases toward this uh, point, which is again the, the wilting point. And if the salinity is as high as this point, then again the plant will die. So we have two stresses, water stress and salinity stress. And the question is, are these stresses additive or multiplicative? Do we simply add the pressure head and osmotic head and plug that into the stress response function? Or 
do we account for each stress separately and then multiply these two, two stresses? And since this question is not really resolved, we provide users both options and they can choose which one to use. We also allow for the compensated rude water uptake. So what do we do here? We define something which we call critical value of the water stress index. And water stress index is defined as the ratio of the actual and potential transpiration. And if this ratio is larger than this critical value of the water stress index, then the root water uptake reduced in the stress parts of the root zone is fully compensated from other parts of the root zone. If we get below this point, then we still compensate for the stresses, but not fully. And we do have a reduction of the actual, of the potential transpiration. How does this work? Well, this is a simple 1D application when I have a root zone. Uh, described like this, root distribution described linearly with depth. Initially, I have a relatively wet soil profile, and so the root water uptake can uh, occur at the optimal conditions throughout the root zone. Then the top layer becomes drier, and eventually we reach the wilting point. That means that the uptake stops in this layer. If we have a non-compensated model, then this reduction of uptake is not compensated from this lower part of the root zone um, by increased uptake. On the other hand, if we use compensated uptake, then this reduction here is compensated by the increased uptake from this zone. The agriculture plants are not very good in this, in, com in um, compensating for the stresses. On the other hand, the natural plants, such as plants in the desert, they are very effective in doing this, right? So obviously this stress index, this critical stress index depend on the plant and it's up to the users how they define it. Uh, we allow different types of uh, spatial distributions from constant to linear, exponential, Hoffman and van Genuchten function, which is here. All these very general uh, functions developed by Brucht et al., which you can see some graphical representations here. We also allow for the root growth, so the users can specify daily values of root depths, they can provide table of root depths with time, or they can use some analytical functions such as this logistic growth function. Uh, if you want to obtain the transpiration rates, actual transpiration rates, we need to integrate the actual uptake over the root zone. So if we integrate the potential uptake over the root zone, we get back to the potential transpiration. And if you integrate the actual root water uptake across the root zone, we get the actual transpiration. And you can see it is basically integration of the stress response function and root distribution function over the root zone multiplied by potential transpiration. How do we deal with the nutrient uptake? Well, so this is the convection dispersion equation in which we have this term which account for root nutrient uptake. And what we do here, we develop a model with uh, Jan Hopmans, which we published in Ecological Model like in about 10 years ago, where we assume that nutrients or chemicals can be taken up from the soil by roots, both passively and actively. And passive uptake describes simply mass flow of nutrients or chemicals dissolved in water. Uh, and active uptakes defines the mass flow of nutrients, which are driven by other processes than pa passive water flow. We assume that passive uptake is the primary mechanism of supplying plants with nutrients, and then the active uptake is initiated only if passive uptake is not sufficient. But we let the users really define this in a very flexible way so they can de decide themselves 
whether passive uptake or active uptake is the prevalent form of the uptake. They can define the uptake and so on. And I, I will not go more in details, but it's all published in the Hydra's manuals so and in this paper. Okay, so now I will want to mention some Hydra's applications. They are about half way through my presentation. So if you look at the Hydra's website, we list there references in which the Hydra's uh, models have been used. And, and we divide these references into two different files. One is for Hydra's 1D and one is for Hydra's 2D, 3D. And in both cases, we have their uh, more than thousand uh, published applications of Hydra's 1D. For Hydra's 2D, we provide not only the list, which is chronological, but we also provide a separate list of some more common applications, such as for drip irrigation, ferro irrigation, uh, transport of different types of particles, uh, groundwater recharge, geophysical related papers, etc. And we are trying to update this as, as often as we can. Okay, so these are the applications which I want to list. And I tried to be relatively general, so to cover large uh, area, large um, uh, lump number of uh, different types of agriculture applications, only agriculture, not hydrological applications. So they involve drip irrigation, trigger drip irrigation, ferro irrigation, uh, water and nitrogen fade in petty rice fields, uh, flow uh, uh, under water and disease stress, or plant uptake under water and disease stress. Uh, the evaluations of different types of uh, mulching, biodegradable and plastic film mulching, intercropping applications, etc. Okay, so first, uh, this slide shows a very typical application in hydro software, which is the subsurface drip irrigation. Uh, we published this paper about 10 years ago, in which we showed that the drip, subsurface drip irrigation can be modeled in many different ways. Uh, it can be modeled uh, as a three-dimensional system with multiple point sources. It can mo be modeled as a two-dimensional system, assuming that drip line is the line source. And it can be solved also as an axisymmetrical 2D system, where we assume that there is symmetry around the, the vertical access. And in this paper, we discuss when these particular applications or approaches are applicable or should be used. Uh, this slide provides details about the classical study of Dr. Skaggs, who is currently the director at the U.S. Salinity Laboratory. And in this study, he used data from the field experiment, which involved uh, subsurface drip irrigation, and a very detailed monitoring of water contents and different at, at different stages of the infiltration experiment. So on the left, you can see the experimental side during the experiment. And you can also see that indeed this drip line can be modeled or approximated uh, as a two-dimensional system. And you can also see the location at the sampling site, which was manual in this case. And you can so also see the numerical representation of the system in Hydras, and you can also see uh, animation of that infiltration process. And on the right, you can see the comparison of the experimental data from these uh, locations and uh, the numerical model, results of the numerical model. And you can see the very uh, good agreement between these uh, simulations and data. Uh, this slide presents an application of another special options which we developed in Hydras uh, just recently, well, in the last decade. And the program can trigger irrigation 
at a specified boundary, which can be surface, but it can be also dripper, etc. When the pressure head at a given location in the transport domain uh, drops below some specified value. And this option was tested in a PhD thesis of Sharon Dabak uh, in Israel. And in these graphs, you can see both measured and simulated pressure heads during the experiment with different potential transpiration rates and different irrigation amounts. You can also see this is the irrigation threshold. And so you can see that once this irrigation threshold is reached, the irrigation applied, uh, so the metrics had increased. And then you can see this gradual redistribution because of the root water uptake, because of the redistribution, and etc. And you can see pretty remarkable correspondence between this data set, which was done in the laboratory, which probably explains some of that remarkable correspondence. Okay, what is next? Uh, this is a federal irrigation. So in this uh, study, which was done, done by Dr. Altaf Sial and Keith Bristol in Australia. So we use hydras to study whether we can make federal irrigation more efficient by modifying the surface properties of the soil here in the ferrule. And we assume in these simulations, then we can either compact the soil here and thus make it less permeable, or we can cover it with plastic uh, film to make it impermeable. And in both of these cases, we would try to prevent vertical flow from the ferro uh, towards the groundwater and force water to move mostly laterally into the, the ridge and towards the, the root zone. We have also studied the placement of the fertilizers and what will happen with the face fertilizers for these different uh, scenarios. And we have demonstrated in this study that this polymer membrane can help maximize the benefits of capillarity and minimize the impact of gravity in irrigation systems. And that they can greatly improve the distribution of water within the root zone. And then we can uh, save a lot of water by taking these measures and we can also limit leaching losses, not only of water, but also of the chemical. Uh, in this study, which was done by PhD students, uh, Julie Sansoulet, we studied the spatial distribution of fluxes in the, the plantation with uh, banana trees. And what uh, Julie studied or measured was that the stem flow around the stem of the tree was about 10 times to 35 times larger than rainfall or through fall through the leaves. And that obviously has a large impact on the infiltration, spatial distribution of infiltration and spatial distribution of fluxes. She installed multiple vehicle isometers in, in her field. And then we tried to model this system and you can see we again obtain quite remarkable correspondence between measurements and data. Another study which I want to mention uh, is the study which was carried out by Dr. Lee, Lee Yong. And he was the researcher from the Hohai University in Nanjing in, in China. And he spent about a year with me in my group. And we published a couple of papers together during that one year. And in this study, we use Hydras 1D to evaluate water and ni nitrogen management in a cultivated rice paddy fields in uh, somewhere in East China during two years. And we use data from one year to calibrate the model and data from the other year to, to validate, let's say validate, validate the model. And then these slides, you can see various measured data such as sur surface water levels, uh, measured and simulated. You can see actual and potential uh, transpiration fluxes measured. And you can see also the leaching or recharge 
of water, both simulated and, and uh, measured. In another paper, um, we, we did for the same field, the nitrogen balance. And in this field, we had multiple applications of nitrogen. And then we simulated the nitrogen in the flood water, as you can see here. We simulated ammonia volatilization fluxes, which you see here. Nitrogen concentrations at different depths. Nitrogen uptake by plant, by rice. And finally, nitrogen leaching at different depths. And you can again see that once we calibrated the model, we could provide very good description of that system. Uh, this is a study which I did actually with the colleagues in India. So they contacted me with the topic that uh, they studied the citrus trees and that they studied the effects of uh, disease on the production of these citrus. Uh, trees. And they asked me to implement in the hydras the option to account for the disease stress. So in addition to water and salinity distress, to also have a disease stress. And they had a lot of data where they, uh, where they related the stress uh, to the to, to propagate count, which I really don't know what it is. But in this data, we fitted the experimental data using different types of functions. So uh, pretty much a threshold and slope function and the S-shaped function. And then we could account for, for, the, for the stresses due to the disease on the citrus trees. Uh, with the other group of uh, Chinese colleagues, I've been working a lot on evaluating the impact of various uh, mulchings, types of mulching, both the plastic films and biodegradable films. It's interesting to travel in China. You will see that in agriculture, half of the country is actually covered by plastic, which causes a lot of environmental problems, obviously. And so there's a tendency to replace these uh, plastic films with the biodegradable films, which uh, biodegrade during the season, or with the sprayable films, which also biodegrade. And so with this group of scientists, we were looking at various aspects of the plastic films and biodegradable films on water flow, on nitrogen leaching, on temperature, etc. And there is a series of papers which discusses that. And, uh, another study which we did with the same group of scientists was where we studied intercropping dripped ecosystems, where we were evaluating the root growth of different plants. And, and in this case was corn and tomatoes and how the root zone overlapped and how they started competing for resources such as for water, uh, for nutrients, etc. And that, that was published in this publication. Uh, this was a study which I did with the PhD student uh, Dilia Kuhl from Israel. And in this study, we tried to simulate fluxes in the vineyard during the day. So obviously during the day, sun moves around the vineyard that creates various shadows. Uh, so the areas are in the sun or in the shadow and the fluxes in that system are very variable during the day. And so we implemented some special options in the HIDAS model so that we could simulate these fluxes, how they change at different locations throughout the vineyard during the day. And you can see, for example, drop during the noon under the, the vine. And that's obviously because at that time, the, that point is in the shadow and very different behavior at the point next to the vine. Yeah. Okay, so those were just some selected applications. Now I want to mention some hydrous add-on modules. So over the years, 
we have developed a large number of specialized modules. And only some of them are applicable in agriculture. So I will not give you details about all of these modules. But what is common for all of these modules that in hydrus we simulate, in the standard hydrus, we simulate flow and transport. And then in these specialized modules, we account for some special reactions, special interactions, and so on. So our most complex model, which we are developing, is this HP1 module, where we coupled hydrus with freak C. And freak C is a biogeochemical model, which can consider many biogeochemical processes and reactions. And then we can simulate very complex geochemical systems extremely. The second model is the Ansatke model, and I will give you a little bit more details about that model. So the Ansatke model can be used to simulate transport of carbon dioxide, but also geochemical processes between major ions. So we can simulate carbon dioxide transport and production, and then transport F and the reaction between major ions such as cation exchange, precipitation dissolution, aqueous complexation, and so on. And so this module can be used, for example, to evaluate the sustainability of various irrigation systems, soil salinization, soil reclamation, and so on. So it's mainly geared towards dealing with soil salinity. But it can also be used, for example, to evaluate release of uh, uh, produce water from mining operations. This is a specialized module, so it can consider only this chemistry. So these are the major ions, and then we can consider reactions between these major ions. Complexation, uh, precipitation of minerals such as calcite, gypsum, uh, dolomite, etc. Cation exchange between exchangeable cations and so on. So it's a very specialized module, but it has a lot of agriculture, important agriculture applications. And as I mentioned, salinization, sodification of irrigated soils, reclamation of saline sodic soils, sustainability of various irrigation practices, in every, and it's mostly geared towards arid regions. So this is the study, lysimeter study, in which we evaluated this model with my colleagues from Portugal. And the goal, this slide shows the application of this Ansatke module to simulate water content fluxes, concentration of individual cations, overall salinity, sodium, adsorption ratio and exchangeable sodium percentage. In this study, the, the lysimeters were highly instrumented, so a lot of data were collected and all the parameters for the model were measured, so there was no calibration involved. And then we ran the model over a period of three years to simulate water flow, to simulate concentration of individual uh, cations in three different lysimeters irrigated with uh, waters of different quality, overall EC and SAR. And you can see that the model did relatively well in all these for all these variables. Uh, there are different periods here. This is an irrigation period. This is a winter rainfall season, another irrigation period, etc. And so you see this diverse behavior of the system. There's also a two-dimensional version of the module where you can do simulations such as reclamation of sodic soil using ferro irrigation and so on. Uh, then we have a wetland module. I will not go into detail, but this is used to simulate processes in the wetlands. So we have multiple pool of car carbon, multiple pool of nitrogen, uh, different types of bacteria, which are involved in nitrification, etc. And so 
that's a relatively complex module. Uh, then we have a C ride module. That's the module which can simulate particle transport and particle or coid facilitated solute transport. We developed this module because there is a lot of chemicals which should be relatively immobile, such as heavy metals, radionuclides, because they sorb strongly to the solid phase, to the soil. But these chemicals also sorb to the uh, colloid particles, such as clay particles. And then these clay particles can provide kind of the means for the fast transport of these chemicals. So that's a specialized module. Then the module duoperm, I will give more details about that one because that deals with the preferential flow, which a lot of people are interested, flow and transport. And preferential flow and transport are likely the most frustrating processors, processes for soil physicists because they really hamper our ability to accurately predict contaminant transport in soils and fractured soils. And unfortunately, the systems, rather than being exceptions, are, are very common in natural environment. And here I show some typical examples from fractured rocks, macroporous soils, where you can see macropores due to macrofauna or decaying roots, and uh, various heterogene heterogeneous sediments where you would certainly have preferential flow. And we cannot describe flow and transport in these processes using classical Richards and convection dispersion equations. Uh, this uh, preferential flow is typically described using conceptual model of due porosity or due permeability, where we assume that we have two overlapping systems of two different types of pore system one present in the matrix and one representing the macropores. And then we can have either immobile water in the matrix in the dual porosity models, or uh, both systems are mobile in the dual permeability models. Uh, we have, uh, this is a schematic of various models which you can use. Uh, most people use simply uniform flow models. But you can also use this uh, dual porosity models with the immobile zone or dual permeability models where you have two uh, pore systems, one with the fast moving water and solute and one with the slow moving solutes. This, this uh, systems are so-called physical non-equilibrium systems. We can also account for chemical non-equilibrium when we can account for some kinetic reactions such as kinetic sorption. We can describe that using one side sorption model, two side model, where we divide sorption sites into those where sorption is instantaneous and those where sorption is kinetic. We can have a two kinetic sites model. This is used usually for transported particles such as colloid viruses, bacteria, and then we assume that one side represents uh, uh, filtration and one side represents the attachment detachment. And then finally, you can have models which have both physical and chemical non-equilibrium. This is how you would find that in the Hydra's model, where you can select the physical non-equilibrium models here, due porosity, due permeability. And here where you can select the chemical non-equilibrium models, such as one side sorption model, two side sorption models, etc. I should mention that most people use the equilibrium models, but for laboratory studies, often people use these more complex models as well. <coughs> and we describe all these models with Rin Fangerufen in this paper in Radio Zone Journal. Okay, I'm getting to the end. Uh, fumigant, that's another module which I developed for California Department of Pesticides Regulations. Fumigants are chemicals which are used to sterilize the soil before planting different types of vegetables. 
And for that, we need some special options such as presence or absence of surface tarps, uh, temperature dependence of flow and transport through the tarps, etc. And so that is in this uh, module, which was validated by, by the group in Sacramento for different types of fumi fumigation applications. As you can see, there's many other modules, um, but I will uh, skip most, most of them. Uh, I will give you some detail about this special module, which we developed only like two or three years ago, where we can simulate fully three-dimensional transport into ferro, which we approximate one by one-dimensional equation for flow into ferro, and then two-dimensional uh, cross-section, which are perpendicular to the ferro in which we simulate flow and transport in the subsurface. This is how this looks like in the Hydra's graphical user interface, where you describe the, the ferro properties, which mean which I mean the slope, roughness for overland flow, etc. And then the program gives you uh, various information about infiltration, uh, the water fluxes through the, the ferro. You can have open end did ferros, blocked ferros, etc. And you get distribution of water and chemicals in the soil. Dynamic plan uptake. That's a model which we developed only two years ago with Giuseppe Brunetti. Uh, there's a lot of interest in, uh, in simulating transport of chemicals which may occur in the soil or which may be applied to the soil with the uh, irrigation. What happens with these chemicals? And the focus here is, let's say, on pharmaceuticals, uh, different hygiene products, etc. And so we developed this module where we coupled hydrus with the dynamic plant uptake model of TRAB. And we modeled this as a comp using compartmental approach. So we have hydrus for the subsurface for the soil where we solve the Richards equation, convection dispersion equation, et cetera. Then we have root and solute uptake uh, described by FEDES. And then we can have, again, passive and active uptake of that chemical. And then we simulate what happens with that chemical. So it goes into the roots. The chemical can undergo various uh, reactions, sorption, metabolization. There can be growth at the roots. From there, uh, the chemical and water follows with the transpiration streams to the stem. Again, many different reactions there. And from stem, it can go to the leaves from which where water evaporates or to fruits, which can be consumed by humans. And then they can consume these, these chemicals. So in this paper in WRR, we developed this module. And then in another additional papers, we apply this module to experimental data collected in the laboratory using different plants, lettuce, spinach, aragula, where we applied the, the pharmaceutical. And then we had data on its presence in the plant, in the soil, in the roots, and also a concentration of the metabolites of this parent compound. And you can see we did some simulations. Uh, there's obviously a lot of interest in crop growth. A lot of people coupled hydras with various crop growth models. Uh, this was often done not by us actually, but by different people around the world where they coupled hydras with uh, the crop growth models from EPIC, from WOFOS, from SWAT. I was involved in this application with DSAT. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you are using DSAT, which is a decision support system for agrotechnology. Uh, it has many different crops, many different managements, uh, but it uses tipping bucket approach for water flow. So it cannot simulate, for example, capillary rise from groundwater, etc. And so I started working with this person here, who is currently the main developer of that system and we implemented Hydra's model into DSAT so we can solve the Richards equation so we can have more proper description in that. 
Uh, we are adding some new options to the model, such as particle tracking. So you can uh, see how water moves in, in the salt profile. So this would be for the arid region. This would be for the home humid regions where the flow is mostly downward. And from that, you can also get the maps of the water age, how old the water in different depths is. And that has a lot of uh, ecological applications. Uh, and I know that ecologists are very interested in this. You will also have in the next version, different types of graphics for those who are familiar with Vondi, where we will have also these like 2D graphs of the water contents, pressure, temperature concentrations versus depths and time. So, more interesting graphics. Okay, so I mentioned that we have tens of thousands of users. Obviously, I cannot support all of them or communicate with all of them. So we support them mostly through the Hydras website. And on the Hydras website, we have uh, about 50,000 registered members right now who downloaded something from the, from the website either the models or our papers or some tutorials or some examples. And we have about 10,000 downloads each year. So it's a pretty busy website. Uh, this is how the website looks like. Uh, you can see we support different models, hiders, stand mode. That's the model for analytical solutions uh, for solute transport, Red Sea models, and so on. Uh, we provide a lot of tutorials where users can themselves learn how to simulate different processes, how to define different geometries, more complex geometries. And they can download uh, detailed descriptions for these tutorials, which are both for 1D, 2D, and 3D. Uh, we have a Hydrus discussion forum where people, if they register, they can ask questions. And as I said, there is thousands of registered people who, who can communicate at this website among themselves. Uh, we provide these references. I have already mentioned that. And so you can search this very easily and find applications which are similar to your applications and you can learn from that. Uh, we list a lot of projects, Hydras projects, so we call it public library of projects where we have projects on different topics on um, how to deal with the metal, how to deal with atmospheric boundary conditions, how to deal with the preferential flow, how to simulate salinity, how to use HP1 model, etc. how to simulate bacteria transport, etc. So we provide a lot of examples, again, from which people and especially students can learn how to model these processes. And this we have both in 1D as well as in 2D. And here I show simply the page where we show how hydras can be used for drip irrigation as a line source or as a three-dimensional, fully three-dimensional applications. And I'm getting to the end, last three slides. Uh, we also provide uh, short courses. We used to do them in, per in person until 2019. And I traveled around the world. One of my, actually my last in-person uh, short course was in India, where I visited the uh, Institute of Technology in Mandi in Himachal state, which I combined with the visit of Himalayas and Parvati Valley, which was a wonderful trip. So that was my last in-person uh, short course. Since then, I was doing only these online courses. But each year, I tried to organize the short course for, for Europe, then for United States, so for this time zone, as well as for Asia. And that's usually around like time, Tokyo time. And if, if there is interest, I can also do obviously such short course for India. Uh, I want to mention that there is a textbook which is called Soul Physics with Hydras, which was written by David Radcliffe, where we, it's a typical textbooks on soul physics, 
where we explain a lot of processes using various tools which we develop, such as Hydras, but also CXT fit to simulate solute transport and explain solute transport processes. We use Red Sea to describe hydraulic properties and so on. So, and finally, a few years ago, we wrote a tutorial book with my colleagues in Australia where we provide a lot of different tutorials. This is only for Hydras 1D. It's an ebook, so you can freely download it from the Hydras website and I guess also from the CSIRO website in Australia. You can download the book, you can download the tutorials, uh, which mean Hydras projects, and you can study these using that. And well, Thank you for your attention. So I went a little bit over time and I apologize for that. So if you have any questions, so I will be happy to entertain them. And I believe we have about 15 minutes for that, right? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dirkar, such for such a marvelous lecture. And there are a couple of questions. I hope you are I... able to. Uh, may I request Dr. Man Singh, PD Water Technology Center from IRI? to ask few questions, please. Dr. Mansik, sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Jirka, for an outstanding uh, deliberation and lecture. Thank In you. fact, uh, it was my dream to listen to you sometimes because we have been reviewing your paper, reading your paper for the last 20 years. And the yeah, most just, recent just... Uh, paper that you pub uh, led by you, a team, published in 2018, where you have, uh, I mean, explained explain the, the merit of 2D and 3D and the concept of three reservoir boundary conditions, okay. well, furrow and wetland, right? So uh, recently, um, I mean, I got a chance to review a doctoral thesis of one of the IITs in India. And there I raised the question that why the student of doctoral student of 2021 they are still using Hydrus 1D. Although the, the, I mean, through various dissemination and publication, the capability of 2D and 3D is already in place with the user interface and graphics and so on. So what limitation you could foresee as an experienced uh, or learned person on the subject? Well, I can understand why it is, right? Because Hydras 1D is public domain, and so they can freely download it. Hydras 2D is not, right? So uh, we, we need to support uh, various programmers and website and all that stuff, right? But uh, uh, a lot of applications in um, agriculture are actually 1D, right? And a lot of hydrological applications are 1D. So. I do think that Hydrus is uh, Hydrus 1D is quite use, useful for many applications. Uh, a lot of experiments in the laboratory where people study the fate and transport of many different compounds, pesticides, heavy metals, viruses, you know, colloids, nanoparticles, etc. Those are all 1D, right? So. Uh, in um, science, we typically try to simplify the system, right? So we don't have to, we try to eliminate, eliminate the complexity so we can focus on some particular aspects such as, I don't know, attachment, detachment, filtration, sorption, etc. So there is a lot of application. So there is a lot of applications for 1D, but obviously there are some system when 1D you cannot use 1D, uh, especially if you are looking, let's say, on the federal irrigation, if you are looking at the, the drip irrigation, etc. But even, even then, the question is, uh, from how large scale you, you look at that problem, right? If you are studied that problem in, in detail, then you cannot use 1D. You do need to study that in 2D. But if you are looking at that problem from the larger scale and you, you want to see, you know, like what happens at the field scale, if you have that drip irrigation, maybe you can then simplify it to 1D as well. So it really depends on the application. It depends on the scale, I would say. But 
yeah, for some applications, you do need 2D and 3D, but if you can simplify it to lower dimensions, I would always actually encourage that. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I, as you I, indicated I from, uh, as you indicated from your, you know, explanation that it's the, the cost of the software, probably if I understand rightly. So is there any thinking at your team level that the knowledge, let the knowledge for the benefit of the society and the for benefit of agriculture and environment and also sustainable development goal, can they, I mean, share those knowledge, uh, I mean, at a, I mean, without putting any cost to that, so that the, the from the students and a scholar who have a lot of database and knowledge, they can use the you know advanced tools and come up with the better results. Thank well, you for time. Yeah. Uh, well, so as I said, right? So we we do provide Hydrus One D, which is in the public domain and it's free. Uh, we distribute all, all everything which is which is on the Hydrus website, right? People can download for free, other than the Hydrus Two D, Three D. Uh, behind these models, such as Hydra Studio, there is a computational module, which, which is uh, which is a DOS program, uh, which actually can be downloaded freely from the Hydra's website. Right. So Hydra's developed was developed. If if I go back to that to some of these slides, where is it? Oh, it's not easy to go back because that was on my very beginning, right? Okay. Where was the history? Yeah, here in this history. Am I still sharing the screen? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you see that the, the, these models with the graphical user interfaces, they were developed based on the DOS program, which do solve the Richards equation, do solve the convection dispersion equation, etc. And so these models like SWMS2D, Chain2D and those, they can be freely downloaded from the Hydra's website. Anybody can compile them and use them. The only disadvantage is that they will not be able to use the, the graphical user interface for uh, specifying the input. And so is it possible? It is possible to use these tools without uh, spending any cost, but obviously, the luxury of using these uh, graphical user interfaces. Yeah, that, that's, that there is some cost involved with that. And there's a lot of yeah. cost involved in developing these tools, right? And we are, I'm not getting any money from the government. Government will never give you money to yeah. develop graphical user interfaces. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manfing. So if you want to make it sustainable, right, we, need, we do need to charge something for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mansing, for nice questions. And there are a couple of questions from the uh, delegates which are in the chat box. We will try to respond. I will request Dr. Jirka to respond to some of the questions. And be sure other questions we will email to him. And after getting from response from him, we will also send you the response. Uh, one question okay. let me ask. Uh, how to set a surface trip emission point in geometry? And what will be the flux assigned to it? One question was there. Could, could you repeat that, please? How to set a surface drip emission point in geometry? And what will be the flux assigned to it? You mean drip, drip irrigation? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Jirka, there is a bunch of questions on the chart window. Can you open the chart window? Uh, I think in a limited time, it is not possible to respond to all questions. We'll sir email to you all the questions and after getting a response from you, we'll send it uh, to your dele uh, delegate. Uh, okay, well, drip irrigation typically is simulated as a variable flux boundary condition, right? So there's a spot at the domain which will be, uh, which will have the variable time variable flux boundary condition assigned to it. And, um, and so you can assign when, when the drip is on and when it is off. Okay. The same would be for the subsurface drip irrigation. We typically basically create a little circle there or semicircle and apply flux on that. 
And then the rest of the domain might have atmospheric boundary condition reflecting precipitation, uh, evaporation, etc. If, if, if there is a, like in this, these applications, which I showed like with the, oh, well, I, I will not get there, uh, which I showed with the plastic mulch, right? So then we would have there uh, no flow uh, through the mulch as long the mulch would be there. But once it would degrade, we would change that boundary conditions to, to atmospheric boundary as well. And so there is a lot of flexibility how to specify these boundary conditions. And we also provide a lot of things where the boundary conditions can change with time. Right? We call that like, I, I forgot how we call them exactly in HIDAS, but uh, you can, for example, has, have a water level in the ferro, right? And when the water infiltrates, so when water is there, so we have a head boundary, when the water infiltrates, the, then it switches to the uh, flux boundary or atmospheric boundary, etc. So there's a lot of possibilities to switch different types of boundaries, which makes hydros very flexible, I think. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, sir, uh, in hydros, where the water and nutrient transport mechanism is dealt more specifically and more mechanistic manner, but whereas in crop simulation models, these things are not addressed uh, so precisely. So, uh, of course, you have, you have showed there is some coupling models have been developed um, for crop simulation models and hydras. Uh, I think more such work should be done because our ultimate goal is to get the crop yield and resource use efficiency. So, uh, such work will definitely get our end product. This is my suggestion on. Yeah, well, the, the hydros never really uh, focus much on the, the plants, right? Yeah. And so in these types of soil physics model, we typically assume that reduction in, in yield uh, is uh, proportional to the reduction in potential transpiration. And so, so that's what we would assume in hydras. Uh, if you are really interested in the different uh, uh, different stages of plant growth, then yeah, you need to, to take some of the crop models or some of these, uh, these coupled models such as hydras and Wofos or these hydras implemented into DSAT, right? Um, so our focus is not really on plants themselves, on the, on the physiology of the plants. We, okay. we don't know much about it. So. <laughs> okay, thank you, sir. Now, yeah. One one question was: What is the fate of the microbes who are which are transported to the hydro zone using the hydros model? Uh, uh, yeah, there is. Yeah, there is uh, probably. We list on the Hydra's website all the applications which are in the literature of the transporter, and I call it particles, right? And those include viruses, um, bacteria, colloids, nanoparticles, nanocells, etc. Uh, mathematically, we describe them all relatively similarly, right? So we assume that there are two removal mechanisms typically. One is straining, so they could get stuck in the smaller pores, and one is attachment detachment. And then different uh, particles of different sizes, right? Let's say bacteria or versus viruses, they will have uh, different constants. They would have different straining constants. Bacteria will get strained very easily, very quickly, right? Because they, they have a uh, much larger size than viruses. On the other hand, viruses will might not get strained at all. And it will depend also on the charge, right? On the charge of the soil, what, what the constants are. And so there is a lot of research going on in this. And, um, and I'm working with uh, one of the leading persons in that, with Scott Bradford with whom we published, I think, something like 50 papers where we were looking at different aspects of 
virus transport, colloid transport, bacteria transport, how it depends on the, let's say, water transient or chemical transient, because all these processes are impacted by ionic strengths, for example. And so it's, it's pretty complex things. And yeah, but Hydrus is very flexible in being able to describe this. And because I'm working with Scott Bradford, who, who studies these processes, so we are implementing better and better tools how to describe these, these processes. So one last question to you. There is a question, uh, how multi, each multi-sync is possible in the same geometry and in Hydras? Multi-sync. Multi-sync? Yes. It's possible because we are using plant as a sink. Each multi-sync is possible under the same geometry in hydrus well we i'm not sure if i understand that right but what could be the thing that would be the drain for example right so we can simulate drain uh another thing would be the root water uptake yeah right so we can simulate root water uptake in the standard code we we consider only one crop uh so we have one uh sink term which is distributed over the root zone, right? Uh, we do have a version, which I share with the people. So it's somewhere in the Dropbox and I just provide the link to it. If somebody is interested, where we have multiple vegetation at the same, well, not multiple, two, two different types of vegetation at the same time. And so we can have two different crop, crop uh, distribution system. We can have two different stress response functions basically two crops, right, in the same system, which can be like plants and shrubs, or it can be, as I showed, right, the, what was it, corn and tomatoes, intercropic system, etc. I don't know if the question was on this or not. But yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. For your... other thing, other thank, things. <laughs> thank you for your response. Actually, okay. your lecture is so marvelous. It has uh, single <laughs> interest among the delegations. There are so many questions. And we will send those questions to you. I, I hope that we will get the response from you and we will okay, send, well, send them to our delegates. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Okay. Don't, don't expect it today, right? <laughs> no, 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 sir. You take your own time. Please take it's your 10 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> please, take, please take your own time to respond to the question. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah. you for this lecture. Thank you. In the next few days, I can do that. Sure, sure. sure. Please take your own time. Okay. Thank you, sir.